Good afternoon. Happy Savage Saturday. Keepers of the Cash. Gary V, the Casual Comic Guy here. This is episode 126 of Savage Saturday Comic Review. And we are going to talk about Conan the Barbarian issue 2 and how it continues the momentum that was set up in issue 1. And uh, still a job well done. And we're going to get into the things that it's continuing to do right. So without further ado, we're going to break into this. And uh, I'm going to be showing you covers over here that were available for issue two. And we're gonna start out right away with a lot of great covers by a lot of great artists, uh, Ian Geis, Roberto De La Torre, uh, just some good stuff and um, super enjoyable stuff, uh, Dom Perrant. And you had uh, just a variety of things that spoke about different stages of Conan, except for maybe the Dom Perrant cover, but that was just fun. Uh, but without further ado, so again, the team on this one was uh, Jim Zub, uh, Roberto De La Torre, uh, Dean White as the colorist, Richard Starkings as the letter, okay, and um, they continue this tradition. So we start out with this story, and there's going to be no spoilers, but Conan and Brissa, as they were last issue, are still together. And what does this story do well that it continues from the first is really all the basics that you need, right? Uh, you have the relationship between Conan and Brissa developing, uh, the dialogue, and I'll be putting panels over here, not full pages, because I don't want to spoil this for anyone that hasn't read it yet. But Conan and Brissa are getting to know each other a little more. Um, there's a little tension, and then a little, um, then um, they develop their relationship further uh, with respect and you get to see a little bit as they're doing this, she's opening up to Conan, Conan's opening up to her, and they're setting the world up correctly. It's through dialogue, it's not telling you. The characters are having conversations, they're having discussions. She's learning about Conan's world by being in Samaria, where his tribe is from. She's experiencing what is going on with the cold, the north, the snow, the, the deep woods, uh, the way Conan moves through them. He's learning about her through what she's sharing with him about her past and her tribe of picks and the adversities they've been through and what's led her to her path and where she is now with him as they march towards this threat that is threatening Conan's home village. So all this is being done quite brilliantly. Uh, it's all done through dialogue. Uh, there is some exposition writing, but it's not... It's not overdone, it's it's slight, which adds to the dialogue. Most of what you're learning is through the conversation of the characters, and that's how a good story is told, right? Uh, exposition's fine in, um, in paragraphs and stuff like that, but we wanna learn the basics that are essential to the story through the dialogue of the characters, and that does this really well. And again, with uh, Roberto De La Torre's art style, it fits Conan and his world so well. It is a perfect mesh. Uh, the coloring by uh, Dean White, again, it just pulls you into the world. The environments and the things that they have to put up with are colored in such a way you can tell all the events are different. And uh, even though they're in, in Samaria, there's things that dictate the way these environments are shown to you. And these are represented really well by the coloring job that Dean White does on this issue. Uh, the lettering's great. It accents the story, doesn't take it away, and it doesn't distract you from it, which is what you always want from lettering. And in certain instances, it enhances it. But the dialogue is great, and you get Conan sounding like Conan, which is a big pat on the back to Jim Zub. Um, there's phrases in there that took me back to Robert E. Howard and how his dictation through Conan sounded. And that's something I really appreciate as a lifelong Howard reader. To hear Conan sound like Robert E. Howard's Conan is something I really like. Now, this book, and you even get more of a feel of it in this issue is a combination, and this is how it feels to me, you may feel differently, let me know in the comments below, 
but this feels like the perfect mesh between Conan the Barbarian from the 70s and the Savage Sword of Conan. Um, the art doesn't shy away from the adult themes, neither does the writing. Uh, it's in there. It doesn't hit you over the head with it. If it's pertaining to the story, it's there. There's nothing that they show or tell that seems superfluous at all. It all seems like it, it should be there. It all seems, and I said this in my first review, and it still stands for this review, it feels earned. The moments that you get, uh, the hyper-violence, uh, some of the more uh, amorous intentions, and and such like that, uh, some of the outcomes that you see. All this stuff feels like it should be there. When you're reading this story, you don't even realize, because you're so caught up in it, how fully they're building this world and paying respect to what's been before. And it's the best thing they've done is pay respect to what's there, but cut their own path. Now, there's not much more I can tell you about this issue without spoiling it, but they meet the threat. Um, the threat has turned into an additional threat. There's something occult that occurs, and we're left with another cliffhanger. Now, this story, um, this is a, a middle arc, so it's meaning. So we're gonna give it, we're gonna give it a B plus. Uh, the action's great. Um, when it's a connecting story, and it, it's only gonna, it's gonna be so high, but it is. We're gonna amend it. We're gonna give that an A. It's an A. Um, the the conclusion's fun. Leaves you with a lot of questions, and it definitely leaves you looking for the next issue, the next piece of this story. This is no holds barred Conan, but in the hands of a team that knows how to use Conan without restraints in the proper way, not in a way that is frivolous or gaudy or not earned. And that's the best compliment I can give this team. This is the Conan I grew up with. This is the Conan I read in Robert E. Howard Tales. This is a Conan I've read by Roy Thomas before. And this is a Conan drawn the way Conan, in my mind, is pictured for comics. And the art is beautiful. Brissa is still a great character. And Jim, if you're watching, let us know how her name is said. I've heard people say it a few different times. I say Brissa, so if it's Brissa, and you watch comment number one. If it's Brisa and you're watching comment number two. Uh, and if it's Brisa, say number three. We want to know how it's pronounced. I think it's Brisa. It's how I've pronounced it since I've read it. But if I'm wrong, I'd like to know. I'd like to pronounce the character's name correctly. I had a few people ask me how it's pronounced. And I said only Jim Zub could tell us. He wrote it. It's in his mind how that's pronounced. So Jim, if you're watching... Uh, do us all a favor and in the comments below, uh, one, two, or three, let us know uh, what the right pronunciation of her name is. We'd all love that. Thank you so much. Uh, but this story arc is going well great. The world building is fantastic. The environments and the characters look great. The coloring, the lettering, the art is all on point. This is a perfect storm of a team that's on this book. And it, this is must read for me. Uh, but that's it for today, guys. Hope you enjoyed this quick non-spoiler review. And until next time, thank you for watching and keep it casual.